My name is Richard August, and I'll be your host for this special one-hour edition of State of the State. Our guest is Justin Katz. Mr. Katz is the Director of Research for the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. He also edits that organization's website, OceanStateCurrent.com. He is the managing editor of Anchor Rising and a more political West website, SabinTavern.com. Welcome back to State of the State. Thanks, Richard. Great to be here. Now, what is or was the Sabin Tavern? I'm really curious. Well, it's actually a, a new venture um, separate from the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, more under the Gatsby Project, which is a C4. So it's a, it's a more political, um, it's just getting off the ground now. Uh, in some regards, you know, with the C3, the, the Center for Freedom and Prosperity is a C3 organization, nonprofit, which means donations are tax deductible, uh, but there are also limits on how far you can go. You can talk policy, but you can't be partisan, you can't endorse candidates and that sort of thing. So sometimes there's a, a kind of a gray area where we need to, we need to back Back off a little bit, especially because there is a constant fear across the country, especially among conservative organizations, that progressive groups will just look for some excuse to go after you. Mm -hmm. Now, the audience might remember that your name from a recent political controversy. You were elected to the Tiverton Town Council and became, I believe, its vice president. And a call arose for your recall and that of another member of the council. Tell us about that. Well, actually, uh, pretty quickly after we started, um, the talk about a recall um, began. I mean, it was, it was really, in some regards, it was, it was like you see nationally with the president. There's, there's a faction in town who just thinks it's not tolerable that we would be on the council. Not only that, but our organization, the Tiverton Taxpayers Association, won a majority of the council. So the voters gave us the power to really change policies, and that was just not acceptable to a certain factions in town. And they spent a lot of effort trying to gin up a feeling of controversy, and that, that got other people to get involved, saying they needed to recall us. Uh, the, the gentleman who pulled the papers to do this, and actually Tiverton, I looked at all the town charters in Rhode Island, and Tiverton's is by far far the easiest to, to effectuate a, a recall. Um, he actually, at first, William McLaughlin took out, wanted to take out papers to recall everybody on a council. He, was, he actually ran for council and was dead last in the race. He's also suing the town for $4 million over a, a garage that they tore down some years ago. Uh, so he was initially going to go after all of us. He narrowed it down to three of us from the Ta Taxpayers Association, Rob Coulter, myself, and Nancy Driggs. And then somewhere, somebody convinced him not to go after Nancy Driggs, and he focused on Robert and myself. Was part of this controversy uh, due to the um, declaration or the attempt to make Tiverton a Second Amendment sanctuary town? No, actually, I would, I would say that, if anything, was the start of calming the controversy down. Uh, the, the claims were, the, the first thing we did that start, really started them off with the, with the talk of a recall, we hired a new solicitor, uh, Giovanni Ciccioni, who, the, the reason our, our prior solicitor, uh, Tony DeSisto, quit the day we were elected. Uh, the reason being we had had, as outside of government, we had a lot of conflict with him. And we've had a lot of experience with Tiverton. I'm sure people in other towns have similar experience. We get the sense that the town solicitor, the lawyer for the town, is making up law in a way that his clients, the town council, want. So there would be, you know, we, as taxpayers, 10, 15 years ago, we'd be trying to enforce what we thought the town charter or state law said. And he would, the solicitor at the time, would come out and say, oh, no, 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 if you look at this word, it applies to that sentence over here. And just this bizarre legal reasoning, or I thought it was bizarre, in order to just give the town council reason to say, oh, well, that's what our lawyer said the law is. We have to go with that. And so over the years, we saw that again and again and again. Um, in fact, Two years ago, our group completely won the election for a charter review commission, and the solicitor would not help them in any way, do any legal language, and that, so he quit. And we wanted an attorney who we could get on board quickly because he made it, the system made it clear he wanted out. And we wanted somebody on board quickly that we knew would 
just tell us what the law is, <laughs> represent the town, not tell us what we wanted to hear. And so we brought in Mr. Ciccioni, and that was the, first, the beginning. There was a lot of drumming up of fake controversy of he and I were buddies or something. You know, it's, you know I was familiar with his work mm -hmm. to some degree. It's a small state. Uh, so that was one thing. And there were, there were a few of those. We, they didn't like who we appointed to the Library Board of Trustees. And I mean, I can give you as much detail as you want. I don't know how much people across the state care. <laughs> and then they, they said we were limiting free speech at meetings, which was actually the opposite of what we, the truth. Uh, so those were the, the excuses, but that's what they were. They were excuses. And they just kept, over the course of their campaign, generating more and more excuses. At one point, we were, we were working with some developer to try to sell all kinds of property in town. And I mean, it just got ridiculous, but that's, that was their rationale. But the, the Second Amendment sanctuary thing, I, I mean, there were people who didn't like that, but those people didn't like us anyway. So, so I mean, the bottom line is there was a faction in town presumably led by Mr. McLaughlin, who was a, a failed candidate for town council, who really didn't like the political stance that your more conservative council members um, were in favor of. Well, I, you know, I, it, it's, you know, local politics. Mm -hmm. I, I think everybody, when you say local politics, kind of shakes their head. Things, weird things happen, and a lot of it's, it's personality-driven. I think ultimately what happened was that Mr. McLaughlin took out the recall papers for everybody on the council. That was his bitterness. And the, the leaders of the other faction who were still on the town council, that's the now we call her the replacement president, or the usurper, uh, Patricia Hilton, and the now vice president, Denise de Medeiros, who was the prior president before we were elected. I think they kind of tapped into him being, Mr. McLaughlin being kind of the face of the recall, so they didn't have to be. Okay. And I think that's, that's more what happened was the established powers in town saw an opportunity and they went for it. And in the end, uh, a lot of what put them over the end were there were, there were five mailings um, to, to support the recall, three of them from out-of-state labor unions, the teachers' union, which didn't make much sense to me because we're on a town council, we had nothing to do with schools or negotiating with t uh, teachers, uh, and the AFL-CIO. So they sent out cards, and they were able to get enough votes to get over the line. So I think that's what happened. It was a snowballed from one guy who was willing to be the one to pull the trigger to other people kind of like opportun opportunistically taking advantage of that. Some time ago you wrote, and I'm going to quote, a basic rule of literary analysis is that every document is a text, every text has an author, and every author has his or her own set of beliefs, biases, limitations, and interests. You wrote this in connection with an article on the state police investigation into the Cranston Police Department in 2014 and 15. One of the authors of the state police report, the number two guy in the state police, Lieutenant Colonel, then Captain, Kevin Barry was recently fired by the new commander, Colonel Jim Manny, over an incident involving the abuse of a prisoner. Now, the Rhode Island State Police is regarded as an elite law enforcement organization, and yet when Colonel Manny took over, he arranged an anonymous survey of the rank and file and that indicated that the organization is not one big happy family, especially under Manny's predecessor, Colonel Ann Asumpico. Would you explain your basic rule, which I found quite intriguing, and how it applies to the state police report on the Cranston Police Department? Sure, well, a lot of, a lot of my background, what I studied was literature and interpreting texts and understanding what was being said, and sometimes what the author didn't even know he or she was saying. And so when, when a government report comes out, especially from an, an, a respected agency like the state police, people tend to take it as this is, just, this is just the facts, and they forget that somebody's writing that. There's somebody with a, I don't wanna say agenda, but with a, a personality, comes in and some people rub them the wrong way or picks up some information and interprets it that way. And it seemed to me in that, that report uh, on the Cranston thing, you start out with, if you break it down to objectively what happened, there were factions in the police department. And this will happen in, in organizations very often, especially ones that have you know, long shifts and people start to break into groups. And I think what happened was you could see as the report went on, the authors of the report kind of picked a faction and you saw it suddenly become the other faction was the was the one they were going after and i think that that's what really struck me about that and the, the way the way it was just reported and to me in an unfair way uh particularly against the mayor alan fung um, but it just it started to seem not like an objective 
here are just the facts. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of dressing that made it, tried to make it look that way, but it, it didn't quite achieve that. And I, since then, I, I've had to, with disappointment, I've had to kind of reevaluate the state police. I, I've just found under Governor Raimondo, a lot of the state agencies have become kind of more boosters or, or things that are politically convenient for her. And I, I think that, was, that report was kind of the start of my suspecting that that was what was going on. The um, this really basic rule, as you call it, certainly should something we should keep in mind when we look at what's happening nationally. I think on the Mueller report, and mm -hmm. now we're involved in articles of impeachment and so forth. And in terms of the bias and political interests of those who are really writing the the whole thing. Oh yeah, and and that's uh, I th I think when I wrote that it wasn't long after uh, President Obama had in was implementing the uh, the Common Core standards and all of that. And one, one of the striking things in Common Core is that they were getting away from literary texts and trying to get to more I don't know dry government documents. And I, and it struck me that that's a way to to make people think they're reading to teach them that when you read, you're reading an objective fact. Whereas when you're reading literature, you know there's, a, there's an author there who's trying to make me think or feel or do something. And I think that's a very important lesson people tend to forget. And uh, more, I think more and more people are savvy to the reality of, say, media bias. Uh, but, I, but at that time, especially some six, seven years ago, it was still the sense that, no, journalists are just objective. And, and it's just not the case. I mean, a lot of them try very hard. And there are things you can look for in their, their writing to determine how well they're succeeding. Uh, you know, obvious questions they don't ask are one way to, to, um, to interpret that. But I, so I think it's, it's very important. And I think there's a, a real push to kind of undervalue uh, the ability to, to read texts and understand that it's another person communicating with you. It's not just how, how the truth appears on a page. It's somebody's trying to say something, even if they don't know their, what they're, specifically how they're biasing it. There's always bias there. Good example on, uh, that I just experienced. I was <clears throat> recently asked to judge a, an essay contest. Um, the, the theme was what, uh, why America is great. And these papers I judged were from a high school history, honors history class. And I would have to say that the writing was atrocious and very much reflects what you're, you're saying, that they take uh, bits of information that probably mostly they get from the teacher, but also f from reading. Yeah. And then they accept that as gospel instead of trying to look, what is the other side? What is the alternate opinion and so forth? And I think you're making a, a very valid point with respect to how our uh, young people are being educated, especially at the high school level. Right, well, I, I mean, I was raised, maybe I got lucky in, in how I was taught how to read and write. And my, my father loves to argue, and we would go to my grandparents' house, and he and my grandfather would argue and scream for all day. And it took me years to figure out they were having fun. Yeah. They were enjoying it. But um, I, Thanksgiving must have been great. Yeah, it was. I, well, I would hide in <laughs> another room usually. But, but um, when, you, when you bring that kind of a argumentative attitude toward text, I, I always loved novels, or most especially non, nonfiction books, uh, particularly if they've got philosophy or something in there. Arguing with the author, a lot of my books have in the margins, this is crazy, you know, that kind of thing. And that's how people should address a text. And it makes it fun. It makes it interesting. And it gives it humanity, because you're trying to connect with the other person, which is what it's all about. And I could see why, as education, the education establishments try to take some of that out of it and make it appear like this dry truth on a page, kids could lose interest and not even be able to write, because they don't, they don't really know what they're trying to accomplish when they write. Now, last week, Mike Stenhouse, the CEO of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, wrote on the website, and I'm quoting, the prices for gasoline could soon rise dramatically for your family if the Raimondo administration undercuts the authority of the General Assembly and moves forward with its plan to sign on to a new stealth carbon tax scheme, the TCI tax a move that would necessarily increase costs on families and businesses at the pump. Tell our audience about this tax pro proposal and what exactly is TCI? Well, it stands for the Transportation and Climate Initiative. And what it is, 
some people might be familiar with REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which was in 2005, Rhode Island joined in 2007. But it's actually multiple states uh, agreeing to make their own energy costs more expensive. So it's, you know, it's nothing that the federal government would pass. And so what the next thing to try is to get a bunch of states to get together and agree to work together. Uh, the way it works, it's, it's a sort of a, a cap and trade scheme. Folks might be familiar with, with that term, where the government, in, in this case, state governments in agreement with this nonprofit uh, regional collaborative will set a cap for gas, they do it right now with, for, uh, for energy, and this will set a cap for, for gas at the dis distribution point. And I mean, gasoline. Gasoline, not, yeah, right. Not natural gas. Right, natural gas is already covered by Reggie. Right. This would, this would add it to gasoline. I think boats are exempt, but we don't have details on that yet. Um, so what they would do, they cap it, and the distributors have to pay. They have to auction, they auction off uh, allowances where you can sell or produce a certain amount of gas. And so that will drive up the price is the idea of it. And then what the distributors pay this, they pass the cost on to the consumers, and then the government collects the money and puts it toward green projects, the general fund, or whatever, or whatever they might they have. Want. Right. Um, the, Reggie has specifically in statutory language limits on what it can be used for. A lot of it cycles into the Commerce Corporation and for all of their economic development schemes and that sort of thing. Some of it goes toward you know, pay, subsidizing solar on houses, that kind of thing. Some years they've used it to lower, to, to reduce the increase in the energy prices uh, year to year. But that's basically what they'll do. They'll, they'll put a cap. So there's pressure on the price that drives up the price. The distributors will have to bid to be able to sell gasoline, and then consumers will essentially be paying another tax, not calling it a tax. Uh, the, the controversy at the moment, the details on this are going to be released December 17th um, in a memorandum of understanding in MLU. And the question, the first question is, what does the government, uh, what does the governor, Governor Raimondo, think her power is? With Reggie, uh, the General Assembly passed legislation in 2007. At initially, Governor Carcieri at the time said no in 2005. In 2007, he changed his mind for some reason. Uh, and there was a legislation that put us into Reggie. The people who are who are orchestrating and developing TCI seem to think that governors just have the authority to join. To raise taxes. Well, essentially, to raise taxes, because they're, they're not calling it a tax. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a trend you can see. I mean, just recently um, in the news, we saw that the federal government, federal courts, are allowing a lawsuit to go forward on truck tolls on trucks only. The same kind of trying to sneak these taxes in and as fees or what have you. And it, that's the, that seems to be the trend, and that's what this would do. It would, just, it would raise gasoline prices. An initial estimate, again, we, we don't have details yet, but the initial estimate is that it'll be about 24 cents a gallon. 24 cents a gallon. Yeah. That's about 10% of what the average price is now, because right. it's around 245, 250. So it's going to go up 10% to fund this re progressive response to what they perceive as an environmental threat because of our lifestyle. Well, I mean, that's, that's the excuse they use. I think it's more just a way to, to limit freedom and, and increase taxation. Um, the, it brings back President Obama caught on a microphone saying, you know, my plan will necessarily raise gas taxes, or gas prices will necessarily skyrocket, I think was his language. That's basically, if they can limit what you can do, we can, some of them are utopian and think, oh, well, everybody will just bike everywhere and we'll all be happy and, and you know, work on our farms and our backyards or what have you. Others understand what they're doing, and they know they're restricting liberty of people, and that's that's really what will happen. And the one of the bits of evidence that that's that's more their goal is if you look at Reggie in Rhode Island, the our energy output hasn't changed. The, the cost has skyrocketed, uh, and the, much more than nationally. And the the amount of greenhouse emissions from Rhode Island has basically stayed the same. Uh, when it's gone down, it's just gone down with the country and less so than the country. So it's not, Reggie's not succeeding. There's no reason to think TCI would succeed. It's just another tax. And then, as I said, when you look at where the Reggie money goes, it goes through the Commerce Corporation, which has been Governor Raimondo's favorite way to hand out little favors to companies so she can say she's bringing business to town, business to the state and that kind of thing. And so I think that's probably what I would expect TCI to do as well, tax to give away to 
to special special interests that have something they're offering government for whatever it might be. Do you think any motorist in Rhode Island realizes that for every gallon of gas he or she pumps, they're contributing 10 cents to RIPTA, which most of them never ride on? The 10, 10 cents of every gallon of the current taxes earmarked for RIPTA. Yeah, well, that, that's a great point. I think. I don't think most people understand most of what they're taxed on. It was some some years ago, just as a personal project, I tried to take every receipt and every bill and everything and go through it and actually itemize the taxes I was paying. I wanted to know at the end of the year, I'm gonna look at my spreadsheet and I stopped because there's just so many everywhere. You can't even tell when you're being taxed. Yeah. Uh, some years ago, we had a, um, a staff member at the center who came in from, from Utah, uh, wanted to see the East Coast and we had an opening. And every now and then he would, he would come to a staff meeting and go, did you know they tax me on this too? And it was just, it, it, it was shocking. I don't think most people understand. And unless you come from another state where you're not taxed on that. Uh, my, one of my nearby neighbors on my street uh, said, there's, wait, there's a water district too? I have to pay taxes to the water district? And I said, oh, just wait. Our, our representatives just passed also a wastewater district that will be taxed on. Yeah. So I don't think most people understand. They just, yeah. it, all this stuff just gets evaporated. And we saw this recently with the, nine, the 911 controversy where the money on the bill to fund 911 was not going there yeah. and we were getting substandard services there and it's specifically earmarked for the 911 system right but it wasn't going there it was going into that black hole called the general fund right guess. exactly and that's that's just it seems like what they try to do i mean they know we're taxed out they know they can't come out and say hey everybody government's not funded well enough so we're going to increase our sales tax rate to 8%. They can't do that. So what they do is they say, oh, we're going to have a fee. And another grab you see are the, in the governor's budget, Governor Raimondo especially has taken advantage of this, are scoops, where you've got these special funds. Um, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, but I, I, I can't at the moment. But just they're dedicated fees that people pay into for a specific activity of government. And then what happens is the governor is trying to balance her budget. And she says, well, look, they're sitting on two million dollars right there, we'll have a scoop in the budget and we'll just require them to give us the two million dollars. It's just a tax by another name. And there's, it's becoming a real, a real problem. Yeah. And the irony is that one of the solutions to climate change is to get people to use mass transit more frequently. But if that happens, that means motorists are pumping less gasoline, which means the subsidies to rip the go down because people are riding the bus and not putting gas on their cars to commute to work. Right. So it's like um, a dog chasing his tail. Yeah, it's sort of like the, uh, the taxes on smoking, right? They yep. said, oh, we'll, we'll tax smoking to discourage it. But then the smoking goes down and the tax goes away and government says, wait, we were using that money for something. It's, it's, it's really a shame. Yeah. Now, let's turn to health care for a moment. Uh, health care and health insurance, which are sometimes used synonymously, and they really aren't. However, in this morning's political scene in the Providence Journal, Governor Raimondo answers a series of questions by reporter Patrick Anderson, which included this exchange. Reporter, do you not support Medicare for all on a political level, but still think single payer is the best for the country? Governor Raimondo said, I think the current proposals are not a good approach policy-wise substantively or politically. Then she goes on, and I'm quoting, theoretically, I think there is a lot of value to a single payer system. I still do. In the 2018 session of the legislature, progressive representative, representative Aaron Regenberg and Senator Janine Kalkin introduced bills that would have created a single payer system here in Rhode Island. Neither one of them is in the General Assembly any longer. Regenberg attends Harvard Law School when he is not organizing protests outside the Wyatt Detention Center. And uh, Kalkin is partnering with Matt Brown and setting up a progressive slate of candidates to run against Democrats they deem to be too conservative or moderate. Now, in 2018, a progressive economist estimated the cost of a single payer health insurance here in Rhode Island at $3.2 billion, about 30% of the entire state budget. The Center for Freedom and Prosperity came out against this proposal, citing their economist study that such a plan would actually cost Rhode Island 
5.4 billion additional dollars. In her interview, the governor opines that a public option is a better solution and that everybody deserves affordable health care. What is the center's position on Medicare for all nationally or a single payer plan in Rhode Island? Well, uh, as is in our name, we, we believe that freedom begets prosperity. And these, these ideas of a single payer system, whether you call it Medicaid for all or, or Medicare for all, what have you, they're, they're really terrifying because the money has to come from somewhere. And we, this goes to the transportation as well. The progressive idea is usually to start with the idea that we're not actually human beings who have preferences and will do things and develop a market because because we have intentions and things we want to get done we create a market naturally out of all of our different intentions and that sets the prices for things and when the government steps in and says well we're going to either subsidize this or restrict that what they end up doing is they they make it's like a the whack-a-mole thing or like when you're trying to squeeze a bubble out of something it just it goes somewhere else so somebody else suffers because they're messing around and they don't they don't know what they're doing and we we've seen with health source rhode island that there's no there well first of all with the uhip program we, we've seen that they can't even get websites functional and processing information correctly but also with with the health source what we saw when that went online was not a lot of people buying the insurance but they found a lot of people who were willing to pay for insurance but who are now a, a eligible for medicaid and so medicaid rolls skyrocketed and drove up costs a, across the board to the point where they start and now they're, they're implementing fees to try to Make every, figure out some way to make other people pay for, for that subsidized population. And so it, it never works out as they want. And the money's got to come from somewhere. You've got to, are we going to pay doctors less? Well, then we're going to have fewer doctors. Are we going to charge people more? Well, then they're not going to go seek things. What you get is rationing. And you see this in other countries where Canada or the United, uh, United Kingdom, where not only do people have to wait for a long time for services, but you start to see government saying, well, <clears throat> we all pay for health and health care now, so um, parents who have overweight children, we can take the children away from the parents because that's, you know, we're trying to keep them healthy and we're all subsidizing oh, we'll put their them health on a diet. Yeah, exactly. And, and they, so they start, so it's really, they, they don't really go anywhere. They start without thinking of people as people. They think of people as, as I don't know, pets almost. These are, oh, we'll, we'll figure out how those people should act. And they start with that pre premise, and they end up concluding, well, people aren't people. So we'll just tell them what they can do, and they'll be better off for it. And it's, there's really a, a hubris to it and an arrogance. And it's really destructive. You see it in, I mean, it's basically socialism. And you see what it's done in Venezuela or every, anywhere it's ever been tried. It doesn't work. You have to start with what people are doing, and if they're doing something bad, figure out how can we change our culture, how can we persuade people, I mean, back to the literary question you asked earlier, how can we persuade people to do things better? How can we come up with some cultural mechanism and, and get them to understand? I mean, religion is, has been great for that. It sets a prerequisite for behavior that, so people act within a range of acceptable behavior. Progressives don't like that. They want to be able to tell people, here's what you're going to do, here's how you're going to live, and it's, it's basically how I want you to live. Mm -hmm. And you end up with no innovation and few doctors and rational and care. It, it's really a, it sh if people stopped and thought about it, I think they would be terrified. And apparently enough do that somebody like Regenberg is no longer in the General Assembly, although he ran for lieutenant governor. So that yeah, when he, was on, when he was running for lieutenant governor, then candidate Regenberg said that he would pay for his proposal by forming a commission and taxing the rich. Now, a member of Ms. Calkin's progressive slate echoed many candidates and the governor who say the cost of universal health care can be paid for by eliminating the administrative overhead of the health insurance industry. You say what? It just doesn't work that way. I mean, you, you see with taxation all the time, whether it's Elizabeth Warren claiming things or Bernie Sanders, you, you would have to tax the rich to poverty and in order to fund the plans they want. And then you don't have, any, you don't have the rich anymore, which may be their real objective. Uh, so it, it, the economics of it don't work. What I, what I try, to, try to get people to understand is in a mar free market system, if you, if you reduce the regulations, 
if somebody is abusing their business model to the point where they're, they're putting billions of dollars to their own pay that could lower prices, if they are doing that, that's a great opportunity for somebody to go and come and say, look, I'll only cheat by a billion dollars and I'll have lower prices and people will shop with me. And that will force the prices down to a point where people have to start paying more because the price is below the cost. Uh, so it, it just doesn't work. And you can also tell by the, the hypocrisy of them. I, I think, I mean, Aaron Regenberg, Brown University, Ivy League, gets out of there, as far as I can tell, hasn't had a real job other than political organizing, goes into General Assembly, decides to run for lieutenant governor. Uh, then somehow, he doesn't win that. That's, you know, by the way, a six-figure job of doing basically whatever you want. He, he would make it a, an activist organization in the state house, probably. So Jorge Lorza, mayor of Providence, gives him an $80,000 a year job just to tide him over till he can go to another Ivy League school to become a lawyer. And these are the people telling us, oh, that we need to tax the rich more, we need to, it just starts to seem like a, a a bit of a scam. They, they, their line is big government. That gets them the money. And so they're going to go after the people who come up with a product that people want to purchase or tr try to provide care um, as, as doctors and say, nope, we're going we're gonna to tell you, you're going to work for the government and we're going to tell you what your salary is going to be. Uh, be because they, I, they claim they think they know better, but I, I don't think they even believe that. I think they just know what's good for them, the, the progressives and the insiders, and they go for it. On December 7th, the Providence Journal ran an article by staff writer G. Wayne Miller, headlined, America's War on the Poor and Our Children. I was around in 1964 when President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. At that time, the poverty rate was thought to be running at about 19%. Now, 55 years later, and trillions of dollars thrown at the problem, a professor at the Boston University School of Social Work has a book subtitled, quote, How America's War on the Poor is Harming Our Children. So it came around from a war on poverty to a war on the poor. Mr. Miller has three takeaways from her book, which he talks about in the article. I would like your response to them. First, he says, the American public in general has bought into the myth that struggling people have it too easy. The professor cites an example of deep poverty, a single mother and a child living on eight, $9,000 a year. We are told by Governor Raimondo and other activists that there are 300,000 Rhode Islanders, one in three, receiving some form of state aid. Your reaction to that takeaway? <laughs> well, one of the, the, the things often people, conservatives, will point out and when these points are made is we live in a country, I mean, there is still poverty, still, still terrible poverty in some extreme cases, but for the most part, no culture, no society has ever been richer. I mean, at the, the joke is that in the United States, the poor people are too fat. I mean, that's, so it's an indication of, you know, there, there's extreme poverty and then there's United States poverty. Uh, and I, I think it's the relative matter. Uh, it makes me think of uh, de Tocqueville, um, I, I think it was, who said that uh, democracy will work, will work fine in the United States until people decide that they can vote themselves more money. And so a lot of this is the progressives trying to tell people, hey, you're not getting what that other person has, so vote for me, get us in power, and, and we'll give you things. Uh, they, they tend not to look at longer term trends, for example, when you look at poverty statistics, you're, you're looking at a snapshot in time. A lot of people who are poor, they're, maybe they're students, maybe they've just had the divorce, maybe they were just fired, they're not poor forever. And if you, if you look at the statistics, statistics over time, the majority of people, I, I think it's, I don't wanna just make up statistics, but I think it's a pretty high majority of people eventually will get out of poverty, and it's just a cycle of how some circumstances, sometimes you're in a hard place and you, you don't have any money. And so that's, that's something to take care of, but it's a different problem than the progressives tend to break people in a Marxist way. They break people up into classes. So you are the poor, 
you will always be the poor, so you need me to take care of you, when really it ought to be, you are poor right now. There's poverty right now, as you made the distinction between the poor and poverty. And it's, it lends itself to different solutions. How do we get this person to not be poor anymore? Well, you give them opportunity. You don't the hand out, hand out, hand up thing. You give them opportunity, you give them a way to to get over whatever their current challenge is. Maybe you even give them a little bit of money to get them over a hump if you can identify the problems they've got. Um, and then the other part, you know, you encourage larger cultural trends, healthy families. You, you're not poor if you've got an extended family, somebody you can go live with, somebody who can co-sign a loan. These are, these are the kind of solutions we really ought to be thinking about. And what the, if you go in the other direction, the progressive direction, with the handouts and the subsidies, you end up creating things like welfare cliffs, where people are making basically a lower middle class income in handouts. And now it's, it's not money they can just spend on things that will improve their lives necessarily, but it's you know medi medical stuff. Uh, they get some subsidy for child care that maybe they don't even necessarily need, but they've got it, so they use it. And what all of these this does, it creates a cliff where at some point it doesn't make much sense to make another dollar because you start losing your benefits. Oh, yeah. So. And it also divides us because you're no longer relying on your family. You're no longer, now you are the person getting money from the government to go work. All right, let me drop my child off at, at pre-K. Uh, and now you're dividing people. It's uh, not to take a tangent, but that's a, an interesting finding increasingly with uh, pre universal pre-K and those sorts of programs is that you actually have children doing worse on average. And one of the probable reasons is that what you're doing is you're taking children away from a scenario which might have not been ideal from a progressive standpoint. Mom might have been staying home or maybe grandma was having to watch the child, but it was better for the child to be in that condition than in a school setting. So their, their level of care has actually been reduced in order to produce this effect, this illusion that, that the progressives are helping people. And they, I don't think they're, I don't trust them to make the right decisions to understand the consequences of their policies. Now this professor, her name is Azzy Lessing, omits something when she refers to the eight or $9,000 a year. She's omitting the non-cash programs such as food stamps, rent subsidies, and so forth. The Cato Institute, recently updated a 2016 study of welfare benefits state by state that shows welfare benefits pay more than minimum wage jobs in 33 states. Rhode Island ranks number seven on the list at $43,330 a year. Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, and New Jersey join us in the top 10. Only Hawaii, at $60,590, and the District of Columbia at $50,820 exceed this northeastern corner of the country. Am I too harsh in this assessment? Oh, I don't, I don't think so. I, I saw an, an excellent chart recently. I, I forget where it was. I read a lot of various economists' blogs and that kind of thing. Um, and it showed that you hear about income equality, but they never calculate either the direct transfer, that is the welfare payments like you're talking about, or the taxes. So if you take money away from the rich to give it to the poor, it, it, looks, like you're, it looks like you've got this big income equality. But if you actually count the money you've given and the money you've taken away, it closes it up quite a bit. But that's, it's exactly the problem is there's, there's not this calculation. There's not, the, there's not enough intelligent and reasonable review of the numbers to, to really be honestly say, what are we doing here? We're taken from people who are producing, and producing this year. I mean, uh, if you talk to people who are entrepreneurial, who are now wealthy, a lot of them will say, you know, there were a lot of years where I was eating peanut butter sandwiches and living in a hovel to be able to make my business work. So you're taken away from people who've produced in order to give to people who haven't. And I, I, I worry we, we take away a lot of the incentive and a lot of the, just the humanized motivation of people to, to thrive on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Miller's second takeaway is the myth of what they call the welfare queen, and I'll put that in quotes. Professor Azzy Lessing cites a young woman who was sexually abused and shuttled around the foster care system for years, poorly educated, has a child, self-medicates with drugs and alcohol. She says, quote, Someone like that needs all the support we can give them without identifying the kinds of support she espouses. Has the war on poverty created four generations of 
dysfunctional, often fatherless families where children are really raising children? I think so, and I, I think maybe worse is it's, it's not providing what they need, what students need. I mean, some, a few years ago, we were heavily advocating for school choice policies in Rhode Island. And uh, one of the pieces of testimony that has stuck with me um, in front of the House Finance Committee, I think, was a woman who's, whose child, thanks to donations, goes to a, just a, a Catholic school, a parochial school in Rhode Island. And she described, not a Catholic herself, how she grew up a lot of substance abuse in her house, and she ended up abused and using. And what she likes about being able to send her daughter to a Catholic school was they were providing a moral foundation and some of that, some of that feedback of appropriate behavior that she didn't get as a child. And I, you lose that when you declare a, a war on poverty, when you start saying, you know what, big daddy government's going to come in and, and take care of your needs. There are certain, certain circumstances where we want a welfare a safety net. We don't want people to, to be dying in the street or that's at that level. But it's not a long-term solution. It's, it's more, let's catch people. It's a net. You, know, you catch them, you get off the net, and you walk away and hopefully get back up and try again whatever you were doing. Um, but I think we've lost that perspective because of this idea that we can come in with government and fix it all. We had a candidate for governor when you said that safety net. Um, and I re forget who it was, but I re recall very vividly he made the comment, the safety net is supposed to be a trampoline, not a hammock. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they, I think that's what we're getting at. But I want to talk about the third takeaway on this professor's comment. And she says, quote, if you wanted to break the poverty cycle, you would invest resources in that family. Support the young woman to finish her education, get the skills necessary for a good job, end quote. Um, do you have any idea what state resources she's talking about, or is this just more pablum from the ivy-colored walls? Well, they, they always want more resources, right? They never, they never say we're not doing things correctly. Let's, let's reevaluate how we're spending our money and redirect it. Um, one, one good solution for this is if you look at international charities, um, increasingly what they're finding is when they come in and they try to hand out clothes or shoes or whatever, they're putting out of business people who are trying to start shoemaking companies in those, those areas. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of problem with saying, let's come in and give this person what they need. And again, going back to, it takes away their human agency, because progressives don't think of people as people. You can't just say to somebody, hey, we're going to get you a job. This is going to be your job. You need to, they need to be able to find what they can tolerate, what kind of job suits them. Sometimes it's not the job that the progressives or, or government's going to come in and offer them or, or set them up with. Um, I don't know how many people have gone to college and they get to their one year in, three years in, or graduate and go, I really don't even like what I studied. I, I don't want to do this for my whole life. That's with people making their own choices with their own money. If you put in government saying, this is going to be your job, you end up with people who aren't very happy. And you end up kind of just this, this worker bee idea. We can just plug you in, and this will be your way, your, your way of life. And I, I don't think it works in the long run. I think just making people stay in school for the sake of being in school <clears throat> doesn't really solve any problems, does it? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, personally, I. Uh, I dropped out after my freshman year in college because I wasn't ready. I went back because I went and I sold fish off a truck in New Jersey, and I said, I'm not doing this, so whatever I study, it's going to be better than this. And uh, I, that, was, that was very helpful to me. And afterwards, I ended up, because it's Rhode Island and it's hard to find work around here, I ended up in construction. And I loved it. I, couldn't, I didn't do it for more than a decade. but. Um, it, you, you try these things, you find your place, and sometimes education is just not the solution. What you get is an inflated workforce where people feel like they need a college degree just to do things like construction or sell fish off a truck. Uh, you, you're really just wasting public resources, and I think that's one of the, the lessons of, of in a, a school education setting is some students don't need that. So if you had, when we were, again, advocating for school choice, which I still advocate for, um, but not, not in an official way, um, the, the idea is you can develop schools. Maybe you can get to the point where you've got, you're actually using education funds as part of a subsidy for apprenticeships. So you're, you're really just helping students find their path and getting their basic education needs that they, they have, but you're not setting up this system of rigid, you need to be in this classroom for 12 years and then we'll let you go to another classroom for another four to eight years. That doesn't work for everybody. And frankly, the jobs don't necessarily 
require it. It's just why you see a lot of you know, identity politics in college. They're trying to look for things to teach the kids because the kids don't know what they want to learn, so they were, we're filling their heads with mush. The Providence Journal published a My Turn op-ed in which you criticized some of the positions taken by State Senator Sam Bell, who used to head up the progressive movement in Rhode Island. We invited Senator Bell to participate in this program, and we did not get a response. Talk about the items in Senator Bell's progressive agenda that you take issue with. Well, what I, what I love about Sam Bell is he, I can never tell if he, he's really serious. I mean, he, he, sometimes he looks like he's having so much fun that you get the impression he's thinking, I can't believe I just got away with saying that. Because some of the things, if, in particular in that article, what I was writing about, um, he got up to call the task uh, Bruce Katz, who was formerly of the Brookings Institution, and Stefan Pryor, who's in the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation. So these are, they're, they're progressive people, but they've got some responsibility for actually making sure policies are, are operational. That's the responsibility Sam Bell doesn't have. And so he came in and manipulated unemployment data in a way that was, wasn't justified and was actually not true. But what was funny about it was the Raimondo administration and Katz and Pryor have been doing something very similar with the unemployment data. Uh, so really it comes down to they, they manipulate data to try to get to a preordained decision of what they want to do. And in, in that case with, with the Commerce Corporation, it's, it's subsidized businesses rather than make, our, make it so that we don't have to subsidize businesses because our tax and regulatory environment is, is more healthy. And then you get Sam Bell in and so I don't, I'm not even sure what his policies are. He, just, he wants more government uh, basically ever, ever, always getting closer to, to socialism is basically what it comes down to. Um, but I, I think in his case, a lot of what I object to most is just his, his presentation. He participated some years ago, and it might, been, it might have been the last time he actually spoke on a stage with a conservative. Um, the center set up a debate, and it was Steve Moore uh, was a national economist, and uh, Tom Scoris and Sam Bell were progressives there. And I remember Skouros and, and Bell kept saying, oh, we've, we've cut taxes on the rich seven times in the past three years. And I, I was doing the technical stuff in the background, so I couldn't really think about it. But I got home and I, I looked up some of what they'd written and I, I went through, back through the law, tax laws and said, seven times. And what I figured out was this, the state actually did lower a, a rate, say corporate tax. And then a year or two later, kind of, fell back two steps and implemented it. They were counting both times as, an, as a cut for the rich, because you can spin it however you want. Either it's the rate, or it's the actual amount, or whatever. But that's what I mean. It's almost like the tongue in cheek. I, so I, I object to that, because I think it, it confuses public debate. And it's really important that we have clear public debate. We ought to be able to sit here and say, this is what you believe, this is what I believe. Here are the facts, and people can decide. But when, you, when you're just saying whatever fits your, your agenda, you, you don't get to do that. The um, most recent report of Roger Williams University's uh, Housing Works RI shows that the price of single family houses and apartments is becoming out of reach for many Rhode Islanders. The threshold at which the definition of unaffordable housing is set at 30% of income. This is an old rule of thumb applied by mortgage lenders in the past, but that was when most buyers were expected to put down 20% of the purchase price. Today, there are many programs for first time home buyers and veterans that require no down payment. Mrs. Ms. McGraw, who was one of the uh, progressive candidates who was on the program said the funding for affordability at both the federal and state levels remain significantly less than what is needed to ensure low and moderate income Rhode Islanders have housing choices that are affordable to them. How do progressives plan on increasing government funding for affordable housing? <clears throat> well, I'm not sure how they intend to do it. I mean, they'll tell you they want to find more ways to tax, right? And whether that's through fees and tolls and t TCI or whatever. Um, the, the more important question, I think, is how do they think this is going to solve any problems? I mean, it's, it goes back to higher education, where we subsidized uh, education, and what do we get? We get a lot of useless degrees that don't do anybody good, but they make a lot of money for administrators, mainly in colleges, not even the professors. It's, it's a lot of diversity administrators and others who are just finding ways to soak up this money because the government's subsidizing it. And I think that's a lot of it. 
again, it goes back to the, the progressives taking people out of the equation. Why are we having housing issues? Part of it's restrictions on, on building, and a lot of that's local. You know, people don't want to let some you know, tenement go up in their town. Or, and some of that's justified, maybe. I mean, some of that's, th these are the, this is what politics is supposed to help us work out. But when your big hammer solution is, boom, we're going to have government subsidize this, which you end up, or, or set restrictions. Every new development must have some affordable housing, that sort of thing. You end up getting distorted outcomes, which just keep driving prices up. So you, first of all, if, if you're subsidizing, people have more money to spend. You know, as you said, they, people used to put money down. So if you're subsidizing them and they don't have to do that, they can spend even more than they would have otherwise. They, they buy bigger houses than they need, et cetera. Or another big trick you see is where there will be a, to fulfill the quota of affordable housing, they'll come up with something. This is, this is we've got one in Tiverton. This is our, our artist colony. And it, it counts as low income. So you, you, have to have a, you can only have a certain amount of income. But because there's a, an, an artistic component, you can, you can kind of weed out which, what it is that's making people poor. And people, people who are considered some, themselves artists are poor for a different reason than people who just haven't been able to, to make ends meet. And the, you get this distorted market rather than letting us use government in a way that lets people say, this is my interest as a, as a resident of this town, this is, and this is my interest as somebody who wants to live and work here. And let that hash out. I mean, that's what freedom and prosperity is supposed to be about, is letting, letting people come up with these interactions. And if, if this person's restricting housing, and this person can't find housing, and therefore can't live there, and can't provide a service job to that person, that person's going to have to pay more for the, the service, right? If you, say, call it, say, a restaurant. If you want to go out to eat, but the, the restaurants have to pay so much so that their wait staff can afford to live in an area, you're going to have to pay more to eat. And if, if we can have a public debate where people understand uh, and fairly address issues and understand how to read and interpret texts, as, as we started out talking about, that, and then you get to where that person can realize, oh, OK, this is my decision. I've decided I don't want any apartment complexes in my town. Therefore, I'm having to pay $500 for a night out with my family. We don't make these decisions because government comes in to solve them for us. And ultimately, it just snowballs. And you get to where you've got irresolvable problems. There was an article by a professor emeritus at URI. I think it was in the weekly newspaper down in South County where he argues that the salary of an associate professor at URI should be pegged to the cost of buying a single family house in Wickford. Now, why he chose Wickford and not Peacedale, for example, I don't know. But um, this is the type of thing that I think is fuzzy thinking. You know, you're going to peg it to the salary to the, to the cost of a house. Um, it almost goes to this concept of living wage. And I find that many of the people that come to this program advocating for a minimum wage, they use the term almost interchangeably with minimum wage. So the question I always ask is, why is $15 the holy grail? Why is $15 considered enough? Why not make it 25 or 35 or 50? And then we'll find happiness together. Yeah, and everybody just gets paid the same amount, no matter what they do. Um, I always. Uh, sometimes it's just a frame of mind. I mean, when I hear about minimum wages, I, what I think is you're actually restricting the freedom of the worker to negotiate what they think is a fair value for their work. And, and it, it, it's so, you know, so materialist. Uh, you know, the progressives seem to, they want to make it sound like they're, they're, they've got a, there's a spirituality about it and they're trying to help people and we'll all be happy. But, but it, it always comes down to money. I mean, I've had jobs that paid nothing but you know, I enjoyed it, or there was some other benefit I was getting, and at that time in my life, I didn't have to get a whole lot of money. I didn't need that $15 an hour wage. <clears throat> These are the, uh, the, the human decisions that the, the progressive approach doesn't allow, and so they end up picking something arbitrary. I think, I think the 15 is just because it comes up with a good slogan, right? Fight for 15. I mean, there you go. Okay, well, you, know, you, you almost wonder if some progressives at the national level were sitting around on the table going, yeah, they've got a fair question. What do we, what is a living wage? Well, I don't know, 
17. Yeah, but that doesn't really rhyme with anything. There's no alliteration. What are we going to, you know, statute for 17? It doesn't have a ring to it. So instead, they, oh, fight. We're going to fight in 15. So we'll go 15. They'll find something else, you know, when they, when they come and get 15, because you've got essentially a, a professional activist class, which we've got with, say, Aaron Regenberg, people who this is how they do their, make their living. And the problem when you develop that, almost like a, a cancerous growth, is it starts to, it starts to become its own depend, independent thing that needs the needs the problem. So if you end up solving poverty, if you end up solving the minimum wage, oh, well, now what do we do? Yeah. So yeah, you, they have no cost. Yeah, exactly. No reason to exist. Yeah, and so you get people, I don't know, sleeping at the promising to sleep at the state house unless they get climate change. <laughs> I, I think that protest was a good indication that we're we're doing pretty well in the country. The Progressive Cooperatives website says or list as one of their goals. I'm quoting, quality public education for all children and tuition-free public college. Well, doesn't this kind of discriminate against kids who go into, graduate high school and go into, a, say, a union apprenticeship program, and therefore they're not going to college, but they have a good paying job, and then they're required to pay taxes to, to provide tuition-free college for, for people who may get degrees in sports communication or family relations or gender studies that have absolutely no application to real, the real world. Well, ultimately, it discriminates against anybody who's not following the pattern that the policy was set up at, that held the policy held up as the goal. So you, not only people who go into apprenticeship programs or maybe who you know doesn't happen as much anymore, but go into a family business where they grew up being taught how to do their job because it was it, it was a business the family built. Or you're discriminating also against people who've, who've already gone out and made it and you're taking their money to give to the, the people who are now benefiting from it. And what makes it even worse is the people who are benefiting from it are not not, they have no incentive to make good decisions about it. They just know they're getting extra money to go get a degree. They don't necessarily know what they want to do with it. So you're taking money from people who often are, I've, I've said this with, with the idea of people who leaving Rhode Island for years and years, <clears throat> we've been losing population. And it's more important who's leaving. It's people leave Rhode Island when they're at that point where they need to turn their their work into money because there's no opportunity here. So you're taking from those people who are trying to be productive to give to people who don't, I mean, nothing against them, but maybe they don't even know what they want to do yet. Uh, and that's, it's, a, it's a real problem, but the redistribution creates this insider system. It gives, it gives excuses for government jobs. It gives excuses for taxes. It gives excuses for, hey, vote for me because I'll go get you stuff from these other people. And it just shifts decisions around. I mean, one of the big problems with CCRI, with the free tuition, was suddenly, oh, wait, people aren't going to Rhode Island College now. Yeah, because they were willing to pay for Rhode Island College. And we talked about it earlier with health care. They were willing to pay for insurance, but now you're going to give them Medicaid, so they don't. Or now you're going to give them CCRI, so they're not going to go to Rhode Island College. They're not going to go to URI. Of course, what's the solution there? Oh, then we need to give them free money to go to Rhode Island College. I mean, it just, it just never ends ends because there's always some way you can find somebody who will take your money and, and give you a vote for it. This has been a far-reaching discussion, far-ranging discussion, and um, is there, are there any areas that you believe that uh, maybe we should have discussed that we haven't touched on? We've got about two or three minutes left, so. Hmm. Well, but I think the, the real, I guess the, the summary is the People need to pay attention, and if, you, if I find if you start with start with the idea that we're all people trying to come up with our, just make our way through life, and you start with that as your premise, and that the goal is to communicate with people, not try to solve every problem, but to interact and to communicate and help people solve their own problems, you, you get a much better result, and you get you get a much. I mean, we, we live in a very divided time, and I think a lot of it comes down to this idea that. Some people think they've got the solution and that their mission is, in life is to solve everybody's problems. And it, it, they end up just making a mess of things. And it's not always easy to unravel. And I think in Rhode Island especially, I, some years ago, um, I went to, when I was first getting involved in Rhode Island um, at politics, so this would have been shortly after the change of the century, um, I was at, at some local conservative event and somebody said, well, what do we do when it all collapses? And I said, well, the hope there is that people will realize it, and then we, we, then we can move forward from that point. We don't want things to collapse, and I think, I think the way we do that is to really start just trying to communicate and 
not impose solutions because, again, it takes a lot of hubris to say, you know what, I know what's going to work, or let alone, I think this politician knows what's going to work. It, they usually don't. We want to thank the audience for watching this special edition. This is our last broadcast for 2019. On behalf of State of the State Communications staff, I want to wish everyone Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and a very successful and prosperous new year. And please stay tuned for future editions of State of the State.